I'm never quite sure how to introduce Colin in artist, art historian, curator, um, marvellous orator, um, and both with experience at British Museum National Portrait Gallery. And I'm really thrilled that he's coming to talk to us tonight about making art out of war. So I hope you enjoy the evening this evening. Colin, thank you so much. How do we start this talk? I know. <laughs> right, well, um, the topic that I'm talking about tonight, it obviously fits quite closely with the exhibition that's on here, um, but it's more, um, less about the, the relationship of the two personalities, um, although of course that's going to be a crucial part of the talk, but I want to be a little bit more broad and try and put their work into a kind of context about what was happening at the time, why these two artists are so significant. Um, and I use the word artists both about Picasso and about Lee Miller, um, because when she started her career, photography was still struggling to find itself accepted as a valid art form. Um, was still struggling, well I think it still is struggling, that the idea that um, a, a, a photographer can be an artist still I don't think has found universal acceptance. But Lee Miller's career, Lee Miller's performance, and I, I use the word performance to describe her life, her whole performance is utterly extraordinary um, and we can put Picasso and Lee Miller together as equals. Now that's quite a huge statement considering the status of Picasso um, who without doubt is the most significant artist of the 20th century. Um, maybe 20 or so years ago there was an argument for Marcel Duchamp being just as important and influential but I think people now today um, if they were to say oh Marcel Duchamp's the most important artist of the 20th century just look at them with an expression of contempt walk away thinking that person doesn't know what they're talking about because Picasso most certainly defines the 20th century he began the 20th century as uh, an art movement, and I'll talk about that in a moment or two. Um, so let's just get on, first of all, to introduce our two players, shall we? There they are. And let's just get the right button. Here we go. Now, we'll briefly introduce Picasso because it's almost a cliche. Well, it is a cliche to say he needs no introduction. Uh, that's him in 1906, and I've chosen a self-portrait from 1906 because in terms of the history of art, we're still in the 19th century. The 20th century begins in 1907 within the history of art, and I'll explain to you why that is in a moment. This is 1906. This is 1976. So, 70 years difference. And you still recognise him, don't you? <laughs> yeah. There's no doubt who that is. Um, and um, I don't want to get too distracted with Picasso. Too many words have already been said about him. Um, because I really want to show you why I think Lee Miller is every bit as important as Picasso. That's 1907 the famous Demoiselles d'Avignon in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a picture that radically redefined what picture making could be. Now, Picasso made this thing, showed it only to a few people, some of whom were horrified and thought, what the hell has he done? And it was a good 10, 12 years later that he was had the confidence to actually allow greater access to it. But now, art historians will tell you, yeah, 1907, that's when the 20th century begins. Now, when the picture first became known to the public, that's how it was seen as a radical 
definitive break with the past. But towards the end of the last century, it was reassessed. There have been massive volumes published about this picture, solely about this picture. And it can be argued that it's actually the most conservative picture, that it's actually looking back rather than looking forward. That, however, <coughs> would be the subject of a completely different talk, so we will leave that there. And look at Picasso in 1928. Now, I've chosen the year 1928 deliberately, and I'm going to show you some other works that were being produced in Europe, specifically Paris at this time. By 1928, Picasso and Cubism have really become part of the consciousness. And Cubism, we have to remind ourselves that Picasso is never an abstract artist. Cubism is often described as abstracting from forms. It's not. Cubism is always representational. Picasso famously said, I have never painted an abstract picture. Picasso's pictures are always about something physical and real. And what we've got here is a young girl. You can see it's a girl, can't you? Just give you a moment. Yeah, okay, you're there. Um, on a beach with a ball. And it's quite a loose, rapidly painted thing. You can see it's not even bothered down at the bottom of this canvas. You can read this quite happily, can't you? As sea, sky. But of course, People don't look like this. It's some kind of creation of Picasso's that's taking its cue from humanoid existence and creating something other, something almost dreamlike. Now, Picasso always tried to distance himself from art movements. But when the Surrealists, and Surrealism now in Paris has really taken off, artists like Magritte, Salvador Dali, André Masson, André Breton, all the different writers. Surrealism, that is the art of the unconscious, the art of <coughs> dreams that reveals to you far more about yourself than you actually knew. When the Surrealists see this and works like this that Picasso's making at this time, they go, aha, he's one of us. He's a Surrealist. This is some kind of creature that's come from his subconscious. And they invited Picasso to actually exhibit with them, to become a member, an official member of the Surrealist group. And Picasso said, no, or rather, he said, no. <laughs> Although I think he's quite happy to play along with it and paint these pictures, make these images that have certainly got a Surrealist content to them. So that's 1928. That's, I think, what we understand more by surrealism. A real dream picture. This is Magritte, painted again in 1928. A picture called The Ideal Acrobat. And you've got, well, you don't need me to define what's about this picture, what's kind of weird and dreamlike about it, do you? So, let's just do a couple more. 1928, Yves Tanguy, a Belgian surrealist. Um, who paints these strange forms that have become called biomorphic in a space that is obviously a real three-dimensional space, but where is it? Some of these forms, you can see that kind of aeroplane shape as well. Um, Yves Tongi was one of the, shall we say, um, uncountable numbers of lovers that Peggy Guggenheim had. And you'll find wonderful examples of Tongi's work in the Guggenheim collection in Venice. And photography. This is Man Ray. And it's a photograph, still life photograph, by Man Ray called L'Etoile de Mer, the star of the sea. The sprockets, they're actually part of it. They're part of the actual image. And the wine bottle, you can see, slightly tilted, like a, in a cubist composition. He's obviously stuck something under that bottle to make it lean slightly. And we've got a bunch of bananas, a half-eaten banana, a starfish. Strange juxtapositions of things that really shouldn't be together. And 
I can't really talk much more about this without blowing it up, which we'd be in a, we'd take up too much time. But the newspaper has been opened at a particular place to add to the kind of strange meaning of this picture. And Man Ray also made portraits of important figures of 20th century culture. I'll show you one of my favorites. One of the most significant players of 20th century culture. The greatest musician by far of the 20th century. It's Stravinsky. You're a photographer, you've got a chance to take a portrait photograph of Stravinsky. What do you do? Tell him to turn the other way, mate. And that, again, has got a strange introspection to it, hasn't it? Now, all of these works were made in 1928. So we're over in Europe at the moment, the, the dawn or the, the thriving of surrealism. Let's move across the Atlantic, 1928. Hey, Vogue fashion model. And I chose the, those images particularly because of the date they were made in, just to show you this contrast. Now, the story of Lee Miller, it's well documented in the exhibition catalogue here in the exhibition that when she was 19, she almost walked under a bus in a busy New York street and was grabbed from oblivion by a man who happened to be Condé Nast, who said, crikey, you're beautiful. Why don't you become a fashion model for my magazine, Vogue? And one thing led to another. And she then becomes almost like the face of the new modern young woman. And first of all, it's almost, it is a cliche to say that um, she was strikingly beautiful. Now that of course is a, a, a subjective term, but certainly she was a head turner. Um, and of course, beauty isn't just about what you look like. Um, the inner personality I'm sure is something that Monsieur Nast um, felt attracted to. And there's another one, I mean, so far away from radical modernism, but maybe not. But to cut a long story short, and the story is well documented, you can find it really for yourselves going around the exhibition here. Um, she goes to Paris. Now, I've left out one or two bits of the backstory. Um, her father was an amateur photographer and very keen to encourage her. She was sexually abused by a family friend when she was seven, which most certainly now we know that if seven-year-olds are sexually abused by a family friend, it messes them up for the rest of their lives. That wasn't so much an issue until relatively recently, but it's something I think that now, in the reassessment of Lee Miller, we have to consider far, far more. Now, off she goes to... Paris, and it's a, a well-trodden story. She goes because she wants to meet Man Ray, and that's him in a photograph taken by Lee Miller. Now, we're not here really to talk about Man Ray, but we ought to for a little bit, um, because she goes there and basically dumps herself on him. That's called confidence, isn't it? I mean, internationally celebrated surrealist artist, off she goes, knock, 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 He's out, he's in the cafe next door. Whoop. Hey, I'm going to be your assistant. And she is, and they become lovers. And um, let's just remind ourselves of the kind of things that he's been doing. Um, one of his most celebrated surrealist photographs um, called Le Violon d'Angre, um, the famous model Kiki de Montparnasse, who was another of Man Ray's models. Um, Violon d'Angre, Angre, the great 19th century neoclassicist, played the violin as an amateur, as a hobby. And in colloquial French, I don't know if this is still true, but it certainly was true in the 1920s, the expression violon d'angle meant a dilettante, somebody who's a hobbyist. So it's got a, a kind of quite deeper meaning, and the Costa Turban is something that you find in Angler's um, voluptuous female nudes. But that's what he makes of Lee Miller. That's a brilliant picture, isn't it? And um, the relationship between the two of them, again, it's something that's being reassessed now. And this exhibition is actually part of this reassessment. And people are suddenly aware of the fact that actually 
Man Ray wasn't doing it all on his own. Lee Miller was there too. And this technique of solarization, of which this is a portrait of Lee Miller by Man Ray in this solarization method of photography, which I won't go into the techniques now, um, but it does seem now that the two of them, Man Ray and Lee Miller, stumbled across this technique together. Whereas if you go back, look at the books 30, 40, 50 years ago, solarization, a technique developed by Man Ray. Whereas she, Lee Miller, was part of that experiment that led to this extraordinary way of making photographs. And this is one of Lee's own photographs. This is a portrait, we think, quite probably, of Merritt Oppenheim, another surrealist artist whose name isn't up there with Magritte and Dali. Shall I tell you why? You don't need me to tell you why. Gender, because she's a woman. So that's a self-portrait of Lee again, um, just after she'd moved to Paris. But she jacks Man Ray in. She, I think, is getting a bit fed up by what now, it might be exaggerating to say it was Man Ray's coercive control, because it was different times. The 1920s, early 30s, different times. And although the idea of freedom and everything, um, it always comes with a caveat, doesn't it? You're less free if you're a woman, but we can say you're as free as men, but actually, you're not. All animals are born equal. That's a Man Ray picture. This is Lee. We don't know who the other woman is. He got obsessed with her lips. Absolutely obsessed. And after the breakup, after she'd gone back to New York, he starts making, this is a painting, these really strange pictures. That one, This one is over two metres across. Sadly, it's in a private collection. I've never seen this. Some rich person owns it. And this is a reconstruction of a piece called The Lovers that's in the Tate Gallery. The original was lost, um, but Man Ray reconstructed it in the 1970s, not long before he died, um, with this folded over lead and this block of lead and the rope almost like a noose and Lee's lips inscribed on it. Right, so Lee's now an independent person back in New York and she starts her own photographic practice, taking celebrity photographs for Vogue magazine. That is Gertrude Lawrence. That is Joseph Cornell, a fabulous American artist who's show at the Royal Academy you might have seen about three or four years ago, with one of his surrealist-inspired sculptures. But then suddenly the world changes. Well, not suddenly. Um, the world changed really in 1933, when Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. And straight away in 1933 in Germany, Great 20th century artists who we recognise and admire today, like, for example, Otto Dix or Max Beckmann, who had roles as professors in the most important German art academies. They were sacked. Their work was called Degenerate and was collected together. And in 1934, just a year after Hitler became Chancellor, the notorious Entartete Kunst exhibition in Munich that travelled around Germany, degenerate art, including works by Picasso, that was laughed at and derided and mocked and hated for having Negro influence, for being Jewish. And bonfires were made, a lot of the work was destroyed. Fortunately, quite a lot of it was sold off, but sold off cheaply in order to get money for the Reich. So not all of it was destroyed. But what I'm showing you here is a photograph taken at night on the 27th of April in 1937, when the uh, Nazi Luftwaffe, the Condor Squadron, destroyed the Basque town of Guernica. And that's where we now change, because... Um, that's what it looked like the morning after. And already in Paris, 
there was an organization coming to a close. It had already been planned for nine years, the International Art and Industry Fair in 1937 in Paris. I'll talk about that in a moment or two. Because Picasso had already been commissioned by the Republicans to make work for the Spanish Pavilion at the International Fair in 1937. He abandoned what he was doing, and after he learnt about Guernica, he starts making these extraordinary images, which of course are all part of the studying, the preparation for his great canvas, Guernica. Now, as I said, 27th of April this happened. I mean, you don't need me really to talk about these. They're self-explanatory, aren't they? Um, this one particularly, which in Guernica, the great painting, becomes, because it's a mother with her child, becomes this figure, and there it is. Now, by June the 11th, he'd got the canvas ready, and he'd already been doing those drawings, and he finished it by the end of June and got it to the Paris Art Fair, Art and Industry Fair in July. Now, this is what it looked like in transit. And there we go, the Paris Fair of 1937. This was a huge thing. All countries from the world were exhibiting there, including Germany that had been invited back in the late 1920s before the rise of Nazism, including the Soviet Union and including every other country of influence that you care to imagine. There we go, the Exposition Internationale, a huge thing. And that's the Spanish Pavilion. Now, excuse me. Would you like me to show you the German pavilion? Yes. Good job you said that. <laughs> yep. They broke all the rules because all of this here, all of these blocks of stone were cut and dressed and imported from Germany. It was important for the German regime at the time to have pure German stone. Nothing else would do. And you can see it was monstrously high with the Nazi eagle and the swastika perched upon the top. Down at the bottom, you can see here, two sets of sculptures. You can see it says there, um, Deutschland, Allemagne. I'll show you the... Um, two sculptures that are down here at the moment, which you can see represent the finest in German art of 1937, with Picasso's Guernica across the road. That's what they look like. This one is called Comradeship. That one is called The Family. And of course, they are ideal Aryan physical types. They are perfection. They are showing you that the German Reich that will last for thousands of years is built upon the physical perfection and magnificence of German manhood. And that actually is a woman, German womanhood. Now, these are made by Nazi Germany's favorite sculptor, a man called Josef Toruk. And let me show you inside his studio gives you a sense of the scale of these things. These two things were made for the 1936 Olympics. And of course, in 1936, um, the Olympics in Germany, in Berlin, um, were a classic example of what we don't do anymore in, on planet Earth. We don't do sports washing anymore, do we? Our great international competitions are just purely about sport, aren't they? Huh. Um, I mean, look at them. I mean, bloody hell. <laughs> and this is also for the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So this is what art should be. And here we've got a wonderful example of Germanic womanhood. Look at him. I mean, crikey. Now, 
These also for the Berlin Olympics. There's a bit of a squabble going on in Germany at the moment because the German nation, the German state, is embarrassed to own these. And there is a bit of kind of argy-bargy going on between the family of Josef Torak and the German state about what to do with these things because, frankly, they are an embarrassment, aren't they? Um, and let's just look one more image of the German pavilion. This is time from the entrance looking out. The Nazi swastika is backwards because you're looking at the flag from behind. But here they are. But look over here. There's another monstrous building over there. That is the Soviet pavilion. And the two of them, the Soviet pavilion and the German pavilion, which actually are called the Nazi pavilion, um, had a face-off. And of course, the Soviet Union at this time, it's Stalin's Soviet Union. Let's look at the sculpture on top. That I mean, crikey. Yet yeah, this is proper communist art. This sculpture is called Russian Factory Worker and Communist Woman Farm Worker. I mean, crikey. Uh, I'm not going to dignify this by even giving you the name of the artist. I even use the word artist in inverted commas. But this is what the world, what Europe was coming to. And of course, oh, view of them over the river, that's the Italian pavilion. <laughs> Just says it all, doesn't it? Really does. Um, now, Guernica is, is one of the defining works of art of the 20th century. And thankfully, we've got documentary photographs taken by Dora Ma. Dora is in one of the photographs through there. Dora Ma was one of Picasso's many lovers um, and an artist and photographer herself. And you can see how this is changing. That hand goes, and down here, the horse, which is down here, you know, the horse is up here, but the horse is being painted in down there. But of course, the horse ends up up here. And that's the final thing with the horse up here. I'm not going to go through this and interpret it for you. Um, because Picasso, when Picasso was asked, so what does the bull mean? What does the horse mean? And Picasso's answer was, well, the bull, it's a bull. And the horse, it's a horse. And of course, to define, interpret a painting is actually to kill it. And he leaves this open. Um, so I'm going to leave it open as well, but just look at Dora Ma for a moment. That's a, a photograph by Irving Penn um, from 1947, because I want to show you a couple of paintings by, of Dora by Picasso, because what is remarkable about Picasso's portraits, now I can't say this from my own experience, obviously, but people that knew the sitters saw, oh, that's Dora Ma. Um, and I've... It's pretty futile putting a photograph from 1947 along with a painting by Picasso of Dora Mar, but I think you can see, can't you? There is some kind of quality there. But the definitive Dora Mar is this picture, the famous weeping woman, which was acquired by Roland Penrose way back um, directly from Picasso. And from, um, there was a robbery the Penrose household in the 1960s and it so freaked Roland Penrose and his family they placed it on long-term loan at the Tate Gallery when they got it back and a few years later it became the permanent property of the Tate Gallery and um, one of the most important Picasso paintings in this country um, and it was made at the same time as Guernica it's got a multiplicity of readings because the relationship between Picasso and Dora Maar at this particular time, shall we say, was fraught. Not fraught for Picasso, but certainly fraught for Dora Maar, who also had Marie Therese on the go at the same time, um, which is a fairly nasty story. I mean, Picasso doesn't come out of this particularly well. Um, but the war is in this picture, isn't it? It absolutely is. And this is Dora Ma with Picasso in a photograph taken by Lee Miller. Because in 1937, just after the atrocity of Guernica and after the World Fair, Lee Miller goes back to Paris. She meets Roland Penrose. They 
begin a relationship and they travel down to the south of France where Picasso is staying at a place called Mougin. And this is at Mougin. There he is. Looks as if he's been caught a bit off guard there, doesn't he? Uh, now, I know that you shouldn't try and interpret something that's taken one hundredth of a second to take, but he does look as if he's a little bit startled, as if he's been, hey, Pablo, whoop, doesn't it? And it's caught him. Um, and I've never noticed either that he's got a Bobby Charlton comb over. <laughs> so he's pioneered this radical hairstyle. And this is a photograph in the exhibition here, um, Roland Penrose and Picasso. They became great friends. And that is his portrait in 1937 of Lee Miller. Now, do you think she looked like this? I do. And I'll tell you why. Because when the Roland and um, Lee started their relationship, they get married and have a child. Um, this one, which belongs, I believe, to the Penrose family still, um, little toddler toddles up, looks at the picture and goes, Mummy! And, okay, now what point am I trying to make here? I don't know. <laughs> But as with the Dora Mar, um, just, and this, there it is. It's a lovely thing, isn't it? So affectionate, too. And a couple more as well with those unmistakable lips. I mean, her lips obviously got Man Ray going. They also obviously got Picasso going because they're always there, aren't they? Now, once the war breaks out, Picasso stays in Paris. I think this is a well-known story. He stays in Paris. Although in 1940, he went to stay in the south of France at a place called Royal. And this is a sketchbook. You can see Royal, 31st of May, 1940. Um, a little handheld sketchbook. I'm going to take you through some of these images um, about basically making art from war. That's really nice seeing that, isn't it? But, right, I'm just going to go through these. They're all dated. 12th of May, 1940. 12th, sorry, 12th of June, 1940. 12th of June, 1940. This skull form. Now, although it's not overt, like Guernica is about one specific atrocity, these are more, the words don't exist really, do they? You know exactly the point I'm trying to make by showing you these. This skull-like distorted form in black and white, again coming out of surrealism, out of the subconscious, menacing, threatening, and a painting he's made. But interestingly here, that they are dated before those drawings. He's made this painting and he's used the painting to sit in front of and draw and try to find more in it. And it's about, I think, really, because of the influence of surrealism, I think, is so apparent on him here. This is almost like self-analysis. Picasso looking at this thinking, why have I made this? What is it going on inside me? How am I responding to what's going on in the world outside. And some of these nudes as well in the Royal sketchbook are very indicative and very powerful. Now, look at that one. <coughs> All again dated, 26th of June, a bit after the skull-like head. And that one particularly because there's a, the sun is in this one, but the sun is black. Now I'm going to show you um, Picasso in his studio down in the south of France with one of his boyhood friends, Juan Sabates, another Spaniard, Spanish poet, also from the Barcelona, um, kind of arty Barcelona set in the 1890s, who moved to Paris and kept his friendship up with Picasso. They were really very, very close. But this painting here is a really interesting one. It's called Woman Dressing Her Hair. And that's it there. Uh, 
<coughs> and it's a very sculptural picture, um, very three-dimensional. The figure kind of blocked in. We know that Picasso was a big admirer of two particular sculptures in the Louvre. Remember, he'd been living in Paris for a long time. Both of them by Michelangelo. The two Michelangelo slaves that they have in the Louvre. There's one. Very close, aren't they? Except he's flipped the gender. And Michelangelo's slave is bursting out of the marble. But as well as flipping the gender, Picasso doesn't have this idea of bursting out. He encloses it. He traps this figure, doesn't he? Now, he was asked after the war about pictures like this and about how he responded to the war living in Paris. I'll read you what he said. I did not paint the war. I mean, Guernica aside, I did not paint the war because I am not one of those artists who goes looking for a subject like a photographer. But there is no doubt that the war is there in the pictures that I was painting then. And I think he's looking at that, saying this with hindsight. The war is there. Now, after the war, he so loved this picture that he was actually given a cast of it. This is his studio in the 1950s. You can see the cast at the back, can't you? Uh, the Louvre arranged to have a plaster cast made of it that he kept for the rest of his life, um, which again is very interesting, showing how, as I was saying, the Demoiselles d'Avignon, how Picasso is actually just as much about looking back as looking forward, if not more about looking back. And to make the point, I want to have a look at a painting in the picture gallery, the Pinacoteca in Bologna, by Guido Reni, The Massacre of the Innocents. And I'm going to, you know, the story from the Bible, mothers and babies and horrible soldiers killing all the babies because Herod's got a thing about a newborn king. And I'm going to show you a detail. And I'm going to show you a detail from Guernica. Whoops, show you a drawing from Guernica. Do I make the point or what? Yeah? And there's Guernica. Oops, comment is superfluous, isn't it? Dead baby. Dead baby. Picasso is so visually literate. He has an encyclopedic knowledge. Um, not just a Guido Reni. I could have shown you works by Poussin as well, that we know Picasso was looking at. But certainly, he's looking back and finding a pictorial language appropriate for his own time. And of course, these pictures are in a particularly awful and horrific time. There it is again. And there's Guernica. You could put these together, couldn't you? It'd be really interesting to do that. Maybe I should write a letter to the Museo, the, the um, Rena Sofia Museum in Madrid and say, why don't you do that? Bologna's not so far from Madrid. You could borrow that. Right, let's get back to Lee, shall we? That's a surrealist photograph, isn't it? Now, she signed up with Vogue. She's gone back to New York now. But she comes back to England, signs up, though, as a war correspondent, war photographer for Vogue. And the pictures that he, she, I mean, this isn't a photograph by her, that is of her. Dressed up in that mask, she's got someone else to photograph for her, um, on fire duty. Now, as um, Anthony Penrose has said, these masks would have been just utterly bloody useless if a fireball had hit them. Um, but it's almost like... They're there as a little bit of confidence boosting. But she took some remarkable photographs. Um, ATS volunteers, ATS Auxiliary Territorial Service, getting ready for duty in Camberley in Surrey. And a male photographer could not have taken that. The fact that she's a woman allows her to document what women are contributing to the war effort. And a really delightful, happy picture. This is South Mims. 
which now I know is a service station um, just coming out of London on the M1. Um, but look at those happy women. And half an hour later, there was a bombing raid. Um, so they are there, happy, um, camaraderie, the sisterhood, but in a moment of huge, great peril. And in 1944, the most important moment of her life, I think, that to me is a powerful image. She realizes that as an American citizen, she can sign up for the United States Army. And she does, as a documenter, as a war correspondent. And this is her in her uniform. I think she had the rank of lieutenant. She is Lieutenant Miller. I love looking at that picture because see what's in there. We know what she's going to see because we've got the benefit of hindsight. We know she's going to be at Dachau and Buchenwald. There she is on her own with her thoughts, looking into the future. And a remarkable picture. These are the other female war correspondents who were also signed up to the US military. And they were there as near to the front line as they possibly could. There is Lee, you recognize her there, don't you? All of these women, I've been preparing this talk, I've been kind of trying to research who these people were. And they've all got amazing stories, all just got the most profoundly moving stories as a testament to their courage. Oh, just one of them, this one here, um, Dixie Tighe. Um, she managed to blag her way onto a B-52 bomber for a bombing raid over Germany. Now, you know, and I know, that those bomber crews, when they took off, knew there was a fair chance they weren't coming back. She was up there photographing, recording, writing, documenting. And all of these women have got the most extraordinary stories. What I love about this picture is it looks as if they are about to go on stage of a musical with Gene Kelly, don't they? They really do. Um, although Dixie here does look slightly apprehensive, but an enormously courageous woman. Um, sadly, she died of a stroke in 1946. She was in Japan covering what was going on in Japan um, and suddenly died unexpectedly of a stroke. But they are all heroines, every single one of them. Right. OK, Picasso. Um, let's have a look at this. As Picasso said, I didn't make things. I'm not one of those photographers who goes looking for things. That photograph is... Now, let's just try and reconstruct how it was taken. She's obviously seen what's going on, seen the GIs, and thought, where do I go? She's somehow switched off, hasn't she? And gone to get the best photograph, the best angle. It's almost as if it's been set up, saying, OK, can you line up over there, please, and just... Move those corpses a little bit over here, then, right, got it. Now look distressed and hold it. But obviously that hasn't happened. She has to be invisible. She's in the same uniform as them, but she's just worked out very rapidly where she can stand to get the best shot. And looking at the responses and the reactions of these people, it's, I mean, it's a shocking, shocking photograph, and its shock doesn't ever wear off. Now, don't worry about these two. They deserved it. And I know we shouldn't really say that because revenge is not one of the most, um, I think, enlightened things that we have in our human psyche. But these are two of the camp guards. And she made a point of photographing the camp guards, especially after the inmates um, who had been liberated had had a couple of hours with them. And they, I mean, they're going to be executed in, within the next half an hour. And they absolutely know that. They just had the life knocked out of them already. And the way she's got them, this makes me think of Holbein's ambassadors. Um, I don't know why, just the two of them looking straight out at you. And the fear in his eyes, another camp guard who again is just about to be executed, 
and this one here, he's committed suicide. He's in one of the rooms here. Um, these were all published in Vogue. And the byline of the article, the heading of the article, was Believe It. Because when the camps were first, were first liberated, we didn't know. I mean, we probably did know, but the public didn't know the full horrors. And this is her text that goes with this photograph in Vogue. One SS man had had enough of everything and hanged himself. That's him. He was taken out on a stretcher, stripped and thrown onto a heap of bony cadavers where he looked shockingly big, the well-fed bastard. So she's got the words as well, hasn't she? That builds up to that punch at the end. Vogue, that was Vogue, June 1945. Then... That's a surrealist photograph too, but it's not. It's a war photograph. This is two Nazis <coughs> in Leipzig who knew what was coming and they've killed themselves in this bourgeois, middle-class, very nice, comfortable, fashionable home. They've decided the only thing they can do, because revenge is around the corner, they know what they've been responsible for, or rather they probably know what they've been looking the other way from. They knew it was going on, and, I mean, who are we to judge, really? But that's such a wonderful photograph. I felt of, I thought I might put that up on the screen with Jacques-Louis David's Death of Marat, an image that possibly some of you will know. But I thought, no, let's not kind of diminish these pictures by comparing them to masterpieces of art history. Um, although I just have really, haven't I? But I just wanted it to speak for itself. Um, the contrast between that plush, comfortable interior and the shocking end that these two people have um, come to. And then some of the liberated prisoners. And where are we for time? Yeah. Um, the next image, which is here, um, on display here. Oh, no, that one. Uh, I'm thinking about the one after this. She travelled around Germany. This is Cologne, after the end of the war. Um, I first went to Cologne when I was a student um, in the mid-1970s, when it, a lot of it still looked like this. The great Romanesque churches that had been flattened looked like this. And I remember as an art student grieving for the loss of these beautiful buildings. But the last time I was in Cologne was perhaps five or six years ago. And remarkably, they've reconstructed these buildings from the original materials. Um, and they feel utterly authentic. They don't look as if they've been demolished. I mean, great 12th, 13th century edifices, um, massive structures that feel as if they are, well, they are original. They've just been knocked down and put up again. That's the beauty of architecture. It's just as much about space as it is about the materials. But that's Cologne, and I mean, wow. And of course, the most famous one is Hitler's Bath, taken by David L. Shermer, who um, was very close to Lee, um, another wonderful photographer. Um, who's a, it's really quite interesting because um, the, he's a very significant war photographer as well, but he's actually been overshadowed by the woman of the partnership. That doesn't often happen, um, where she's decided to sit in the bath, Hitler's own bath in his private apartment in Munich, and they've obviously put the picture of Hitler up there, and this is... They, they were at Dachau that morning. This is the mud, the muck on the boots all over Hitler's bath, um, bath mat. Um, a real powerful, powerful statement. Um, and he, sorry, she goes back to Paris, meets Picasso just after the liberation. Famously, when Picasso saw her, immediately after the liberation, he said, aha, I haven't seen any American GIs yet. You're the first member of the United States Army I've seen. And it, brilliant, it's her. And he takes, she takes this photograph. And she sees, of course, the works he's been doing, like this. And this, still life with pigeon. See the arrow going through the pigeon. Heads like that. 
and drawings like this, which is called Embrace. Yeah, okay, let's call that Embrace, shall we? Now, when Lee sees things like this, remembering what happened to her when she was seven, as well as the things she's just been witnessing in Buchenwald and Dachau, like that, and that, and then Picasso, in the late 40s, before the liberation, starts work on this picture. This is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's called the Charnel House. And um, Picasso's friend and documenter, Zervos, took lots of photographs of this in progress. It was originally inspired, said Picasso, by images he had seen of a documentary film of a Spanish family who had been slaughtered by the nationalists in their own home under the table. There's a table up there, you can see. Um, and that's how it started. That was Picasso's original idea as a monument to the Spaniards who'd been murdered by the nationalists. Then he saw Lee's photographs. That one is the one that is here. And when we look at Picasso's drawing, don't you see how... Lee Miller's work is actually influencing Picasso. It's actually having an effect on how his work is developing. This painting was acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in 1971. At that time, Denica was there, on show there. <coughs> they didn't own it, <coughs> and they knew it was going to go back to Spain because Picasso had said, I want this to go to Spain but not while Franco is still alive. Franco died in 1981. Next day, Guernica is crated up and goes off to Spain. The Museum of Modern Art had acquired this knowing that Guernica would go. They wanted to have this one, Charnel House. Um, and it's a picture that I can't quite get to, to grips with. I'm not sure it's got the same horror as Guernica. It's maybe a bit too conscious, <coughs> but who am I to get a downer on the Picasso? Um, but um, it's a picture that wouldn't have the form it had were it not for Lee Miller. And what he must have thought of her, knowing what she'd seen, because Picasso hadn't seen anything like this, remember. She had, and we haven't. And one of the labels on the captions in this exhibition it says that um, although it was undiagnosed, she was possibly suffering from PTSD. Now, I read that and I thought, possibly? <laughs> Why wouldn't she be? Um, and the last years of her life, of course, were alcoholism, depression, and she locked all of the stuff away um, that was only found by Anthony after her death. Um, and I think it's true of people that do witness or live through such horrors that they just don't want to think about them. Um, and it just affected her so, so much. Um, but really, just to finish, I've got a little bit left to toast not just Lee, um, but those amazing women um, and all war correspondents. Um, there's a book just come out by Fergal Keane, um, who has had diagnosed PTSD, about why he keeps going back to these sites of ghastly things in places like Rwanda and Bosnia. Um, because without them, we wouldn't know what was going on. And it's fabulous seeing these pictures because <coughs> Picasso is the big name. We're putting Picasso and Lee Miller. Actually, this exhibition, it should be Lee Miller and Picasso. She's the one who's calling the shots. And I think Picasso is very much in awe of her when he makes this picture. So thank you very much for listening to me. I think I've gone on quite long enough. Um, so here's to Lee and all of the war correspondents who risk their lives every time they go into these ghastly places. Thank you. Thank you.